Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's quarantine clinic. Today, we are discussing how to approach uh, a case of uh, higher mental function disorder and how to go about examining the higher mental function. Now, this is one of the more uh, complicated parts of the neurological examination and one of the most time consuming. So, um, we will take it uh, slowly and I'll give you an overview. Uh, so, I wanted to finish this within 45 50 minutes. So, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, how to. Uh, how to understand the different parts of the uh, higher mental function examination and uh, what are the different tests that you will do in each part. So uh, let's begin. The basic idea of doing your higher mental function examination is localization. Now, if you've attended the previous uh, quarantine clinics where we took uh, cases such as neuropathy, myopathy, then uh, in every clinic, I stressed how important it is to uh, perform your history taking and your examination to basically answer these three questions. Where is the lesion? What and why? So our higher mental function examination is no different. The main purpose of doing the higher mental function examination is to find out where is the lesion. And in terms of your higher mental function, when you say where is the lesion, you actually mean in which lobe. So a quick revision of the lobes. There is the frontal lobe. There is the parietal lobe. There is the temporal lobe. And finally, there is the occipital lobe. Now, you may remember the uh the basic functions of each lobe so your frontal lobe has the function of uh, deciding your personality it uh, decides your uh, practical thinking uh, that your frontal lobe is the part of your brain where you plan things your parietal lobe is the part of the brain that uh, helps you see the three dimensional structures around you occipital lobe is where your vision center is located and temporal lobe is where you hear and where your memory is stored. So this is roughly what each lobe does and the purpose of higher mental function examination is to have an overview of your entire brain and go into the depth of each lobe and do certain tests in order to localize where in this uh, in these four lobes where is the problem because there are different diseases that will affect different lobes. So coming to uh, the patient. So now if there is a patient in front of you and you think that there is something wrong in his higher mental function. So what is the first thing you will do? So what is the approach? What is the flow chart? So the first thing you will do is observation. So just like in your uh, abdomen or your CVS uh, or your respiratory, the first thing is inspection. So similarly in neurology, the first thing you do is inspection. You observe the patient. And when you observe the patient without talking or saying anything, there are certain things that you notice. And that is you notice their appearance. You notice their general demeanor. And you notice whether they're, so in appearance, you'll notice how they are dressed, how they appear. You'll notice their mood. So this is to give you an overall impression of the, uh, the circumstances in which the patient has come to you. Now, coming to the actual examination, there are, multiple things to be done. So one of the confusing aspects of the higher mental function testing is where to start from because uh, everything seems to be important and you don't realize where to start and where to finish. So the logical approach is you need to do those things with, without which you can't move ahead. So that is a good way to think about it. You need to do those things without which 
anything further will be pointless. So the first thing you do after you observe the patient is you check for level of consciousness. Now, why is this important? If the patient is unconscious, there is no point in doing further testing because if the patient is not going to be responsive to your commands, then you can't really test for language. You can't really test whether uh, they are able to understand what you're saying or whether they are able to uh, see properly because they will not answer any of your questions. So in level of consciousness, you can have a conscious patient, you can have a drowsy patient, you can have a stuporous patient, or you can have a comatose patient. And within level of consciousness, you can also do something called as Glasgow Coma Scale or Glasgow Coma Score, in which you check for your eye movement, your motor response, and your verbal response. Now, check out uh, Glasgow Coma Scale and how it is scored. I don't want to go too much into detail, but this is the overall uh, parameters in which you will classify level of consciousness. Now, assuming that in your particular patient, the patient is completely conscious because if he is drowsy, stuporous or comatose, you can't really go ahead with it. Now, in a fully conscious patient, the next thing you check for is whether they are attentive. Now, attention and orientation are often taken together. So why is this important? If the patient is conscious, but he is absolutely not paying any attention to you, then you will not be able to go ahead with the examination. Because whatever you are saying, if the patient is completely distracted, if the patient is looking at the television, he's looking outside and he's absolutely not paying any attention to you, you can't move ahead. Okay? So one of the first things to check is, is the patient paying attention? And one easy way to do this is something called as TAP A test. So what is TAP A test? TAP A test is a way to see if the patient is paying attention. So you say out different letters and you tell the patient that every time I say A, you tap. So you say out random letters, C, F, K, U, A. And as soon as the patient hears the letter A, he has to tap. And if he's not tapping, that means that he's not paying attention. The second aspect to attention is orientation. So if a patient is very disoriented, so disoriented to time, place, and person, it will be very challenging to move ahead with the higher mental function examination because a disoriented patient, you won't be able to trust whatever uh, responses they are giving. So for example, if you ask them to name a color and if they're not able to name a color, you are not sure if there is something wrong with the visual pathway or is he just disoriented and not paying attention. So these two aspects, attention and disorientation sort of go together. Okay. So supposing you have a patient who is fully conscious, who is attentive and is oriented. What is the next step that you have to go to? You have to check for language. Now, why should you check for language next? Because every command that you will be giving to the patient, you will be using some language. So you need to check if the patient is able to A, understand what you are saying so he's able to comprehend and he's able to respond so if there is no language it is difficult to move ahead so the next step that you do is language testing and there are certain things that you check for in language that i will get to and after this you check for memory now why is memory tested here because there are a lot of tests that you will be doing in higher mental function that will require the patient to remember some information at least for a little time. 
maybe a few seconds, maybe a few minutes. So if the memory is gone or if the memory is impaired and the patient performs badly at some test, you won't be sure if whether this is a memory problem or whether it is a test problem. So that is why after language, you test for memory. And within memory also, there are certain tests that I will get to. Okay. So this is, you can think of this as a sort of preparation for your higher mental function. And it is also a part of your higher mental function. So these are the tests that you do to make sure that you are able to do your next tests properly. But these tests also have a localization value. Now, how is that? So you checked for attention. Now, attention is required for your testing, but attention is also a part of your frontal lobe test. So if your attention is gone, you could say that there is something wrong in your frontal lobe. So we are actually doing the higher mental function test, but we have still not started doing it anatomically which is how ideally all neurological examination should be done. We should follow an anatomical course so that we have clarity of thought. But in this case, we need to do these tests first so that we can move ahead. Now we looked for attention. Then we looked for language. Now language is seen here in this area. Okay. So a part of language is in the temporal lobe called Wernicke's area which is useful for understanding, so comprehension. And a part of the language is in the frontal lobe called Broca's area, which is used for speech, so motor output. So if a person is not able to talk, he may either have a problem in understanding or he may have a problem in speaking. So that is this area. Then we also checked for memory. Now memory is a part of your deep temporal lobe so that is in this area so these are all different lobar functions but we have we have checked for language and memory before we have completed the frontal and the parietal so ideally we would have liked to go anatomically we would have liked to finish frontal first then parietal then temporal and then occipital this is what we would have liked to do but we do these tests first okay now, what are the uh, language tests that you want to do? So the language tests are, you check for spontaneous speech. Then you check for comprehension. I'll tell you what each of this is. You check for spontaneous speech, you check for comprehension, you check for repetition. And then you check for naming and then reading and writing. Okay, so this is language. <coughs> now, in spontaneous speech, you ask the patient to first of all, just tell you his complaint. That is a very easy way and a natural way. And the patient won't feel like he's being tested. But in your mind, as you're listening to the complaints, you are also listening to his speech. And you're seeing if he's able to talk properly. Now, there are two basic problems that can be there in speech. One is that he's either speaking too much or he's speaking too little or it could be normal, okay? So if he's speaking too little, that could be because of a motor problem, motor output problem, which would mean it is a Broca's area problem. And we already told you how Broca's area is in the frontal lobe. Now, suppose he's talking too much. This could mean that the Broca's area is normal, but there may be something wrong in the Wernicke's area. Because in a Wernicke's area patient, he is not able to understand what you are saying, but there's nothing wrong in speaking. So a person who's able to speak, but he doesn't understand a lot, will actually end up talking a lot more. 
Now, this is a useful thing to remember both in neurology and in life. So, a vernicase uh, aphasia patient will end up speaking a lot more because his comprehension isn't much. So, this is the basic idea of spontaneous speech. Then you check for comprehension. So, then you check for is he able to follow my command? Is he able to understand what I'm saying? So, you say point to the fan. It's a simple term. It's a simple command. Point to the fan. So if the, if the patient is able to just point upwards or at least look upwards or gesture in any way that he has understood what you're saying, then comprehension is intact. Now, there are different levels of comprehension. There is simple comprehension and complex, but we won't get into that. Third is repetition. Now, repetition means I'll tell you something and you have to just repeat it. So suppose if I say a phrase, no ifs or buts, that's a phrase in English, no ifs or buts. And if the patient is able to say it back, that means that the patient's vernicase area is intact. So he is able to hear it, take it in, send it all the way to the frontal lobe, to the Broca's area, and the Broca's area is able to give it output. So his input, repetition and output is intact. We don't know if he has understood the phrase no ifs or buts, but in repetition, we are not testing that. In repetition, we are only testing if this connection is intact. And this connection is called as arc arctuate fasciculus. So the connection between your vernicase and Broca's is called arctuate fasciculus. So if your repetition is intact, that means that your vernicase is okay, your actual fasciculus is okay, and your Broca's area is okay. Then you ask for naming. You ask him, you show him two things. You show him a watch and you show him a pen. And you say, what is this? So if he's able to name, then that means his naming area is intact. Okay. Then finally, you have reading and writing. You, you show a written command. You, you write on a piece of paper, close your eyes in a language that he understands. And then you show him. And if he's able to read and do it, that means his reading is okay. And then you ask him to write something. So not his name. You ask him to write a full sentence. And therefore, his writing area is okay. Now, I don't want to get into the detail of each one because uh, that will prolong the lecture. But this is the overview of language. Okay. Now, one thing I want to mention is that before you test for language, it's very important to ask for handedness. So, if he's right-handed or left-handed, because we want to know the dominant lobe. So, if a patient is right-handed, it is almost 99%, 95% chances that his left uh, lobe is dominant. And if he's a left-handed also, majority of the patients, I think 60% of the patients still have left-sided dominant and 40% have a right-sided dominant. <clears throat> so that is important for you to localize which lobe is gone. And now finally coming to memory. There are different types of memory. You have immediate memory. So immediate memory is if I say something and you immediately say it back, your immediate memory is okay. You have something called working memory. In working memory, if I give you something, you need to be able to manipulate that information in your mind. So you need to be able to keep it in your mind for some time. So the good examples of these two is digit span. Now, if I tell you a four digit number, if I say four, five, seven, nine, and if you are able to say four, five, seven, nine, then your immediate memory is okay. Now, this is called as forward digit span. Okay. Now, if I tell you four, five, seven, nine, and if I tell you to say it backwards, then you are testing your working memory so four five seven nine the backward would be nine seven five four so here you need to keep those initial numbers in a place and then you need to work on them you need to manipulate that data so this is called as backward digit span 
and this tests your immediate and your working memory the other types of memory are recent and remote so recent memory is something like what did you have for breakfast today morning uh, were any guests came to your house yesterday or today so this is recent memory things that have happened recently and remote memory is when did you go to school what year did you get married all of those things so remote memory is things that have happened in the past and uh, there is another kind of memory called as semantic or episodic memory so these are basically facts so you can ask who was the first prime minister of india where is the capital of india so these are all facts that that patient may remember okay so that covers the preparation so when you start off with your higher mental function this is how you go about it you'll observe the patient look for appearance look for mood uh, check for consciousness you check for attention orientation language and memory now after this you go on to your lobar function so what lobar function tests is that you check for each individual lobe specifically but before you go here there is one thing that you can do which is called as the mmse which is mini mental status examination false teens mini mental status examination okay so because this initial part so level of consciousness attention orientation language memory because this is so important and this is sort of the vital part of your higher mental function what neurologists found was that it's not necessary for every patient to undergo lobar function test because that would take too long so instead what they did was this initial part of the testing they converted it into a condensed form and they gave it a questionnaire kind of a look and they gave it 30 points and so now you can measure out of 30 points what is the mmsc score and then if the mmsc score is low then you can go ahead for a low bar function test and if the mmsc score is normal then you can assume that the higher mental functions are normal now there are certain flaws to the mmsc but roughly it is a good score uh, and it is a good test to do it is a kind of a screening test okay so what is mmsc so you need to know mmsc uh, especially in mbbs and md you should know mmsc uh, because you may not go ahead with your low bar function test in most of your patients so mmsc is out of 30 points and uh, those 30 points are sort of divided in this way orientation gets 10 points out of which orientation to time and orientation to place gets 5 points each then memory has 6 points out of which you check for registration registration means immediate memory and that gets 3 points and then you have recall which is working memory so are you able to remember something for a few minutes so recall gets 3 points so you give the patient three things to remember and if they are able to immediately remember then that's registration if they are able to remember after some time that is recall in the middle between these two you need to do something to distract the patient so that they their mind is diverted away from the registration so here you look for calculation and the test to be done here is serial 7 so you give you ask the patient to subtract from 100 you ask the patient to subtract 7 five times so 100 minus 7 five times so the patient will give you 93 86 79 and so on and you have to come till 65 and 
the patient gets one minute to, uh, to do this. And if they are able to do this, then the patient gets five points. Okay. And um, so that completes your 21 points and then you move on to language. In language, there is naming, which has two points. You ask the patient to name two things. There is reading, writing, and copying. So one way I do it is that you ask the patient to name a watch, and then you ask the patient to name the pen, and then you give the pen to the patient, and then you ask him to, or rather you take, you take that pen and you first write a command. So that can be close your eyes. And there you check for reading and comprehension. So if the patient is able to read this and close the eyes, then that means that reading is intact. And then you give the pen to the patient and you ask him to write a sentence. And then copy a diagram. And that diagram has to be two pentagons that intersect with each other. And the intersection has to have four sides. So this is the diagram that they have to copy. And you have to check whether did they draw two diagrams, two pentagons, and did the intersection have four sides. So if they did copy this, then copying is intact. Then uh, finally, you have three-step command and repetition. So repetition is no ifs or buts. And three-step command is when you ask the patient to take a piece of paper, fold it twice, and then place it on the floor. So that is three steps. Take, take the paper, fold it twice, and place it on the floor. So what we want to check is, is the, is the patient able to do these three steps in the right sequence? Okay, so three-step command is three points, and everything else is one, one point. And naming is two. So finally, you get 30 points. And you check the score out of 30. And normally in an educated person, you need to have around 28 points. If it is below 23, there is something definitely wrong. <clears throat> now coming to your low bar function. Now low bar functions, you, now you will do it anatomically. Okay. So the first set of low bar functions that you will do is frontal lobe. And in order to do low bar function tests anatomically, you need to know basically what are the functions of each lobe. So your frontal lobe has some important functions, which is executive. So executive means you are able to plan something and you are able to arrange the plan. So if you, if you want to make T, your frontal lobe will decide that what is the sequence of events? What will you do first? What will you do later? And your frontal lobe is also able to stop you from doing wrong things. So if while making tea, instead of sugar, you accidentally pick up salt and you're about to put it, it is your frontal lobe that will make you stop and put it back. So this is all part of your executive function. Your frontal lobe also decides your personality and your insight. And your frontal lobe has something called abstract thinking. So abstract thinking will be something like, tell me the meaning of this proverb. So where there is a will, there is a way. Now, if you say this proverb, what does this actually mean? And what is the abstract version of this? So the frontal lobe will decide that. Also, you can ask similarities between objects. So you can say, what is the similarity between a table and a car, okay? So uh, the person might say that they both rest on four objects. So the car has four wheels and a table has four legs. Now these are abstract concepts that the person is able to uh, think about. Inside the questions will be, if you find some uh, notes, if you find somebody's purse on the ground, what will you do with it? So then the person will have to imagine 
uh, that if I find the purse, I will find the address, I'll send it back. So that shows insight. Now, executive functions are basically all about planning. Okay. And sequence of plans and able to stop stopping yourself from doing wrong things. So that is called response inhibition. Okay. So how do you test these things? Now frontal lobe tests are really interesting. The first thing that you do, uh, you can check for response inhibition by doing something called go no go test. So go no go test is you'll ask the patient to clap once if you clap once and if you clap twice the patient should not clap at all okay so what will happen is when you clap once the patient will clap once but if you clap twice there is a natural tendency to clap twice in response but if there is your front if your frontal lobe is working properly you will be able to stop that so that is response inhibition there is also another test called Stroop test. And Stroop test is uh, interesting because it uses different colors and different words. So for example, oh, sorry. If I write different colors, and so on, I'll ask the patient to only read out the actual color of the ink and not read out the letters. And the natural response to reading this would be to first read out the word. So I would, uh, I would find it easier to say black, yellow, and blue, rather than saying the color of the ink, which is blue, red, and green. Now, this is response inhibition. So whatever is your natural response, if you're able to stop it, and then you are able to override that response, that is a function of frontal lobe. Then there is something called set shifting. Set shifting means, suppose there is uh, one of the tests for this is trail making test. So there's something called trail B. So in a piece of paper, I'll write one to 10. And I will also write letters A to G, for example. Okay, so, so this much is enough. Now I will ask the patient to connect letters to numbers. So if I have to connect A to one, then I have to go to B. So now I have to find out B and then I have to go to 2. And then I have to go to C and then I have to find 3. So on. So this is set shifting. So you are going from letter to letter and number to number. And if you are not able to match those two, after C, the tendency will be to go to D and then E and then F because that is the natural sequence in your brain but we are trying to set, shift between two sets. So this is called set shifting. And this is really important in multitasking. So your frontal lobe is very important in multitasking. If you're able to manage two, three things at once, so you're able to shift between multiple sets. <clears throat> okay. And uh, finally, there is something called as fluency. So the idea of fluency is that you need your frontal lobe to be able to continuously come up with new things to say. So if I ask you to name all the vegetables that start with, uh, or rather if I tell you to name all the vegetables and I give you one minute, 
your it is your frontal lobe that will keep coming up with all the list of vegetables that you know okay so your front your temporal lobe has all the language stored but out of all those words which ones are vegetables and which ones do you have to say now that is a job of your frontal lobe and uh, there is a test called fab test f a b so name all the words that start with f all the words that start with a and all the words that start with b and i'll give you 1 minute and then i'll count how many words you can say now this is a test of fluency i think that's enough uh, that is all about the frontal lobe so i hope you understood the overall function you have executive insight and abstract testing and these are the executive tests that you do now coming to parietal lobe now the concept of parietal lobe is spatial orientation but here your left and your right parietal lobe actually have slightly different functions okay now let's do the left one first because it is there is a characteristic syndrome associated with your left parietal lobe which is called as Gerstmann syndrome and this is seen when there is a lesion in your dominant parietal so usually your left lobe is the dominant one so if your left parietal lobe is involved then you will get gerstmann syndrome and this is good to remember because whatever is the component of gerstmann syndrome are the uh are the things that are lost if there is a left parietal lobe damage so what is gerstmann syndrome gerstmann syndrome is four things there is a calculia a graphia there is finger agnosia and left and right confusion so the way i remember it is when you say gerstmann syndrome i think of holding up my palm and if you hold up your palm you when you calculate you tend to use your fingers so all the things that you use your fingers for you can correlate with this so you are not able to calculate with your fingers you can't write with your fingers you are confused about your fingers themselves so you don't know which if this is your middle finger or this is your ring finger or your index so you are confused as to which finger is which and you are also confused about left and right okay so when you hold up your palm you are actually holding up your entire gerstmann syndrome so you can't calculate you can't write you are confused as to which finger is which and you are confused between left and right okay and uh, that is about left parietal lobe there is another thing that is involved in your left parietal lobe which is called as apraxia now apraxia has been traditionally uh, a little difficult to understand initially but the uh, so i won't go too much into depth but the basic idea of apraxia is that you are unable to do something even though your motor functions are normal so if i tell you to uh say hammer a nail into the wall okay so if i tell you that uh, take this hammer take this nail and hammer it into the wall your motor functions are okay your hand is strong you are able to see the hammer you are able to see the nail and you have the strength to hammer it but you can't do it because in your brain you are not able to uh, either understand the concept of what the hammer is supposed to do or you are unable to plan it so you might 
start hammering before you put the nail or you might not even be able to do that because you can't even come up with a plan of action okay so that is apraxia so that is the concept of apraxia and there are different types of apraxia i'll just mention it just to complete it there is conceptual there is ideational there is ideomotor and there is limb apraxia and these sort of go uh this is the worst and this is the least involved okay so why is this the worst because in conceptual apraxia you have lost the context the concept so supposing there is a hammer and there is a nail now in conceptual apraxia you don't even know what the hammer is supposed to do okay so you have lost the concept of the hammer in ideational apraxia you have a concept you know what a hammer is and you know what a nail is but you are unable to plan so you can't plan how to uh, arrange the sequence so you don't know how to plan this hammering of the nail okay in ideomotor you can plan but you are still unable to do it so there is something wrong between the part of the brain that plans and the part of the brain that finally gives the command okay so in this part of the brain so there is one part that makes the plan of action and there is one part that finally gives the command so if there is a lesion between these two areas you have ideomotor and this is the most common kind of apraxia and limb apraxia is a very specific kind of apraxia where uh, there is a lesion in your corpus callosum so i don't want to go too much into depth but uh, just remember that ideational and ideomotor are the more common ones and out of those two ideomotor is the more common one and the difference is that in ideo in ideational you can't even plan the movement and in ideomotor you can plan the movement but you are not able to do it so this is why in ideomotor you can uh, when somebody else is doing it you can copy it okay uh, so fine that is all about your left parietal lobe and in your right parietal lobe there are three specific things one is hemi neglect hemi neglect is when you completely ignore one side of your body so if you have a right parietal lobe lesion you may completely ignore your left side so if somebody is hitting you on your left side you may not sense it or uh, if there is somebody coming in from your left side you may ignore that person you may not uh, see it even though there is nothing wrong with your a vision you may still ignore it because for you the left side of the world doesn't exist so that is hemi neglect you have constructional apraxia and you have dressing apraxia i won't go too much in depth but the idea is um uh, again it is all the same that you know, the left side of your world doesn't exist so even when you are dressing you may only wear your shirt on the right side and you may ignore the left side of your uh, body so you may find somebody very well dressed on the half side but shabbily dressed on the other side so that is uh, dressing apraxia so that is it with your parietal lobe now with the temporal lobe the good thing is that you have already done all the tests because the two main parts of the temporal lobe was memory and language and you've already tested both of them so your temporal lobe can be ignored for now because you've already tested them and coming to occipital now occipital takes some understanding okay now uh, i want you to sort of step away from the lobar function test and just think about the concept of the occipital lobe uh the occipital lobe is here and the function of the occipital lobe is to analyze visual images visual input now if you see something okay so let's stick with the hammer you see a hammer 
when you say you see a hammer what you are actually doing is this hammer is an image and this image will uh, hang on i'm going to make it easier so okay now here is your eye okay so this is your eye and this is your retina okay now what happens when there is an image in front of you this forms this goes through your lens and then it will form a image on your retina okay so whatever is above will come below whatever is below will come above so your hammer will look something like this on the retina also what is right will go left and left will go right so everything gets inverted now from your retina you have your nerve fibers so you have your optic nerve and here it will cross over in the chiasma from both eyes and then the you have the optic tract the optic radiation which will finally reach the uh, occipital lobe and it will go via the thalamus lateral geniculate body and then it will finally reach the occipital lobe so when it reaches the occipital lobe it will go all the way to the back which is called as the primary visual cortex okay so the absolute back of the head the occipital pole that is where the images will go to so when i say the image going there what does it mean does the whole hammer go there no because that hammer gets split up into probably millions of small 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 impulses okay so all those different optic fibers will carry the image of that hammer into different areas now in the occipital lobe all those multiple images will get put together and finally this image of the hammer will come so there are different cells to see shapes of right angle there are different cells to see straight lines there are different uh, occipital lobe cells that will see curved edges so that is a whole different conversation but finally you have the image of the hammer now this image will get sent now let me draw a bigger picture of the occipital lobe this is occipital lobe so if the image has come all the way here the image will get progressively sent forwards okay now somewhere along here suppose here it is just multiple small small dots and as the image gets sent forward it gets processed more and more so somewhere around here supposing the image of the hammer comes in okay but we still don't know that it is a hammer now what will happen somewhere along here so these are different visual cortices so somewhere around the fifth layer you check for color and somewhere along the way you check for movement so you check what is the color of the hammer is the hammer moving or not so different pieces of information keeps getting added as this image goes ahead now finally it reaches a place where you have the entire information about this hammer now what will happen this image will get sent into two places okay so one is the parietal lobe and one is the temporal lobe why does it do this because we need to know two things we need to know one what is this image because we have an image that is great but we don't know what is this image and we need to know where is this image so both of that is important because otherwise how will you do anything so you have this image but we don't know what and where it is so here there is the image of the hammer and it gets sent here to find out what and it gets sent here to find out where so this is called as the dorsal and the ventral pathway so i told you that the parietal lobe has a three dimensional space 
so now you know in your three dimensional space where is the hammer and your temporal lobe has memory so your temporal lobe will compare this image to all the images that it has stored and then it will finally come up with the idea that hey this is something called as hammer okay and what does it mean so one is the word hammer and the other is the meaning of the word hammer so both of these two things are separate okay so if you are interested this is called as the phonological loop and this is called a semantic loop it's it's too deep you don't have to go there but just try and understand that everything you see goes down into these two pathways okay now why did i tell you so much because you sort of need to know uh, this much basics to understand what is occipital lobe testing so your primary visual tests are all about can you see at all so you check for acuity so you do your snellens chart and all that you check for field of vision you check for color okay so these are your primary visual tests then you check for your secondary visual tests now in your secondary visual tests you will check two things you will check if there is anything wrong in your what pathway and if there's anything wrong in the where pathway okay now what can be the things that are wrong in your what pathway so if there is an image here and it is coming here there can be a lesion in multiple places there can be a lesion very close by so as soon as the image hits the visual cortex there could be a lesion here or here or here so as you go further down the road you get more and more information added okay so suppose you have a lesion very close by so as soon as the visual Im impulse hits here and then you have a lesion you can't even put this image together so you can't even see the image so forget about knowing whether it is a hammer or not you can't even see the image because it's not put together yet so this is called as a perceptive agnosia so agnosia means inability to know so we are talking about visual agnosia so inability to see and why can't you see because the image hasn't even been put together that is a perceptive agnosia suppose it goes a little bit more ahead now the image has come okay the image has come but we haven't added a meaning yet so there is no meaning to this so we can see the image but we don't know what it is so this is known as associative agnosia so you know the you can see the thing but you can't associate it with anything okay now how do we differentiate between these two here you can't even see the image so if i show you if i show the patient another hammer or if i if i put a table in front of him and keep two three hammers and i put another couple of things i put a couple of mobile phones i put a couple of uh, uh, glasses then and if i give him a hammer and i say pick up another hammer from the table he won't be able to do it because he can't even see what he is holding properly so i won't ask him to hold actually i'll just show him something and then say match this with something else but he can't do it because he can't even see it so that is a perceptive whereas in associative he has seen the image so he will be able to match it so if there are two hammers he will be able to match them but he can't tell what either of them do so he doesn't know what it is used for okay so that is that another kind of uh, lesion is that there is a separate tract for faces okay just to see faces there is a separate area and if there is a lesion there that is known as facial agnosia 
So inability to recognize faces. And uh, that is known as prosopagnosia. Okay. So inability to recognize faces. So this could be your familiar faces, obviously faces that you've seen. So either in your family or they are famous. So one of the two. So either you know them personally or you've just seen them on television or whatever, but you should be able to recognize those faces. And finally, if there is a lesion in the wear pathway, that means that you can see the image, but you are not able to put it together in a three dimensional structure. That is called as simultagnosia. <clears throat> so this is all about um, seeing an image in context to the overall uh, surroundings. Okay. So there are a couple of ways to test for simultagnosia. Uh, one is there is something called as uh, letter cancellation. Modified letter cancellation. So you write A's in a small way, and then in the middle, you write a big A. And you give this to the patient, and you say, whenever you see an A, you cut it out. And you'll find that the patient only cancels the small A's because he's literally unable to see the big picture okay so also something that is important neurologically and in life so if you can't see the big picture you may have simultaneousia now another way to test this is uh, you write a big letter but you write it using small letters so for example you want to write a c but you write it using another letter like S. Okay. So here, if you ask what letter can you see, the patient may say that he sees the letter S and he can't see the letter C. So that is simultagnosia. And I think that covers your higher mental function. That is the overview. And it's 757. So that is perfect. Um, the overview is Initially, you will do certain uh, tests to check for uh, whether the patient is conscious, uh, oriented, attentive. La then you test for language, you test for memory, and then you go on to do your MMSE, which is actually the same thing. You don't have to test for language and memory separately. You check for MMSE. But the thing with MMSE is that in MMSE, if you find that there is a problem in language, for example, so if he's not able to name or he can't read or write or copy, then you need to do a detailed language testing. So detailed language testing is this. You check for uh, all of these things separately. Okay, and uh, one, one interesting thing I wanted to show you was about speech. And I wanted to show you this. This is the Devnagri script and why am I showing you this? Because there is, if a person is unable to speak, it may be a problem in the brain, which will make it a UMN problem of speech, or it may be a problem in the speech apparatus. Okay. So that would be an LMN speech. So that could be a, a, a problem in the in the in the tongue so sorry this is a umn element is not a good way to say it it could be aphasia which is a problem in a speech problem because of the brain or it could be dysarthria so that is inability to speak clearly now what will be the main difference the main difference is that in dysarthria your grammar and your syntax will all be okay. So the, the choice of words will be okay. The comprehension will be okay. When he is speaking, he'll be speaking in the right way, but his speech will not be clear because of something wrong in his speech apparatus. So when I say speech apparatus, what, what do I mean? 
so your speech apparatus goes from your throat all the way to your lips okay so in your speech apparatus you have your uh, vocal cords you have your throat you have your palate tongue or lips and teeth so when you speak you are actually using all of these different uh, different aspects of your speech apparatus and a problem any in any one of this can lead to dysarthria okay and the reason why i'm showing you this chart is because uh this is the devnagari script and they have actually arranged it in a wonderful way okay so ever since i realized this arrangement i have been very impressed with uh, uh the way that our indian languages are structured because <clears throat> you can actually see that they have arranged the letters in the in the manner of origin of the letters so there are letters in which you only use your throat those are called guttural sounds then there are letters that you use your palate so that is called palatal sounds then there are letters in which you use your alveola which is the top part of your mouth then there are letters that you use your teeth and then there are letters that you use your lips so when you say the first line of the devnagari script so k k g g n they are all using your throat so those are called guttural or velar sounds okay then palatal sounds are uh the ones you use your palate so when you say ch ch j you are using your palate then your uh, alveolar or your tongue point so alveolar sounds are t th d d n then t so if when you say these letters you will realize that the movement in your mouth are very similar and that is why they are arranged in a sequence and you compare this with english letters and the see after this the sequence there doesn't make any sense so uh yeah i just wanted to point out that this has been this is a very interesting thing and uh, it is also a useful way of Uh, localizing the lesion so if you ask somebody to read the uh, devnagari script the letters then you can literally point out at what point the lesion is in a, a speech defect because those letters he will not be able to say okay so i think that covers it that's all i wanted to cover uh, now if there are any questions you can ask me and uh, tomorrow we will discuss cranial nerve examination which part is uh, responsible for converting the inverted image onto a normal image which we see so lovely question bhavesh and uh, the thing is that we don't know if it gets inverted or not so which is why there is a big controversy whether the world we are seeing is it actually the way we are seeing or is everything inverted because we are seeing it in that way but uh that is just a software thing so our brain doesn't really care if we are seeing an image upright or not because for the brain it is just data information so <laughs> there was a very 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 interesting experiment that people did which is uh they use something called inversion goggles so what they did was they put on a pair of spectacles that inverted the world and one one scientist wore that continuously for almost a month i think so initially for the first 7 8 days he was not able to see anything because everything was inverted so he couldn't function after some time it sort of corrected itself because the brain sort of realized that okay everything is inverted and i'm having trouble so it sort of corrected itself and then he began to see properly again and they did this test in animals also and they did it on a cat i think and the initially for one or two days the cat couldn't walk properly and then suddenly started walking normally with the spectacles so 
for the brain it is just data and it is just a, a matter of putting things in the right place so we don't know if that upside down image in the retina ever gets uh, straightened up again maybe our world is truly upside down absolutely maybe it is can you explain about phonological and semantic loop uh, so the idea about the phonological and semantic loop is that uh, suppose your your hammer is formed here there is a loop that looks for the word associated with this image and that is phonological loop and there is another loop that looks for meaning which is a semantic loop so what happens is uh supposing there is a problem here so then the person will not be able to tell either word or meaning so if i show him a pen he will he can't say the word pen nor can he say what is its use okay so he can't say that you know you use it to write or he can't even gesture that you use it to write because he doesn't know because the lesion is here but what if sorry one second what if the lesion is here so here what will happen the image is formed the image tries to go down the path it will go down here and it will go down here now it will go down the semantic loop but there is a lesion here so there is no meaning you can't understand what is the meaning but it will go down here and the image is associated with a word so now that patient will associate it with the word pen so he will say pen but he won't know what to do with it so he doesn't know the meaning of the word pen but he will say the word pen because his phonological loop is intact now something very very interesting will happen he will say it he will say pen now what will happen because he will say it they become sound waves and they reach his ear okay and through his ear it will go back to the temporal lobe now just as there is an image formed in the occipital lobe similarly in the temporal lobe also these frequencies will form one particular pattern and that will also go to the same to areas and there is nothing wrong in this area and so the brain will compare the word pen to the meaning and then the patient will realize ki this is something that you write with this is the concept of the phonological loop and the semantic loop okay okay thank you all for listening and uh, tomorrow we will meet at 7 o'clock for uh, cranial nerve examination